but yeah. so I will just speak for about an hour or or yeah. less and then I will just open to questions okay. I, I always try to give time for questions I don't try to I don't delay my talks it's not my style if you saw last time I tried to make it very concise and very clear and that that you know I do it was just perfect you know it, the, 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 you gave so much energy and so much information that um, you have started a lot of thoughts uh, in my mind too <laughs> well this is a more fun this is a more fun talk it's my most popular talk from the different ones I give so well yeah maybe we should really start I think uh, those of you who um, okay. are being late uh, you will see the recording yeah, of the beginning so let me please uh, introduce our dearest guest here uh, John Nye uh, he has so many um, um, <laughs> I just couldn't state all of your uh, achievements because I, I have a list of 11 at least and uh, no, no winner of research grants among those 11 uh, statements so uh, John Nye is a professor of economics at George Mason University he is a founding member of the International Society for the New Institutional Economics. Also, uh, he has a lot of interest in, uh, in history and is a member of uh, the editorial board of the Economic History. Not anymore, I used to be. Oh, okay, used to be. And uh, so uh, the last time I've heard uh, John's uh, lecture, John's speaking uh, was very, very intensive, very uh, interesting and uh, well, he, uh, has started to be a friend with the International Economics Olympiad for well, almost half a year, maybe even more now. And I, I hope that we will continue uh, this friendship uh, longer. And I would also be glad to invite him to come to our event live uh, someday when, when we go out of this uh, pandemic. So please welcome John Nye. Thank you. So I'm going to share the screen now so we can all watch. Uh, okay, I'll do this here. And we will go to the presentation. There we go. Can you see the screen now? Yes, the yeah. full slide. Yeah, the, it's full slide, right? I can see you and the slide. No, and it's the not the full slide. slide. We can see the next slide also. Oh, that's bad. Let me remove that. Um, okay. Let me see. Let me wait, 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 wait. Stop share. Let me fix this. I don't know why this is doing this. Why is this doing this? When I first met uh, the idea of the dragon, uh, I kind of imagined a dragon in the European way. I thought that the dragon that uh, Asians use uh, is the same. And it seems like I was mistaken. So I think. I don't know why it's suddenly forcing me to show the side, the next slide. I don't have to change this. Uh... Customs present online. Sorry. So while John is um, switching on the uh, presentation file, uh, I, I, I can tell my story about, about the dragons. <laughs> so, uh, the European way of thinking about the dragons is well, like it's huge flying creature. Uh, and it seemed like in Asia, the dragon is a water living uh, creature that is long, wise, and ancient. It was, it was a huge difference for me when I first knew about this. So, is it working now? Uh, I think with the only thing I can think of is just to go ahead and let them see the next slide. I'm sorry well, about that, but that's uh, huh? That would be okay. I, I think it's it's not. That's okay. 
So I'm sorry about that, but we will we will just share, okay, now. Okay. Uh, this way we see almost full screen. Okay, let's do it this way. So um, good afternoon or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I see almost all of you are from Europe, Russia, the Central Europe, that kind of thing. So thank you very much for uh, coming today and also for the people who are watching this recorded, recorded version. So I'm gonna talk about an old paper about you know, a dozen years old now that I published with Noel Johnson and then tell you a little bit about some of the updated material work we've been doing on this paper. So the first issue is why are we studying this? Well, one issue that's important for the social science is to ask one question, how irrational are irrational beliefs, right? What does it mean to, I mean, to talk about superstition? Well, is it bad to believe in them? Is it good? Is, is it something you should follow even if you don't believe in them? And the related question is how do superstitions or luck survive in foreign environments even where this belief is not shared by the general population. So these are two of the issues that come up when you start thinking about this talk. So enter the dragon. East Asians, especially Chinese, but in many cases, Koreans and Japanese as well, as well as overseas Chinese throughout Asia and the world, tend to believe that children born in the year of the dragon are luckier and likely to do well in life. Um, it's interesting that even those who don't believe it are aware of the superstition. Why is that? Well, one of the first reasons is traditionally of the Chinese zodiac. The Chinese zodiac is based on the lunar calendar, which is um, not, and that's why, for example, this year, Chinese New Year began in February. Um, but interestingly enough, most of the, of the animals in the zodiac, like the ox or the rat, this is the year of the ox or the cow this year, and you have animals like the rat or the snake or something like that. These are all creatures that exist in the real world. The only mythical creature is the dragon. And because of that, uh, the believers in these superstitions or these traditional views attribute special properties to children born in the year of the dragon. In general, tend to, people tend to believe they're going to be more successful, luckier, smarter, etc. Well, David Goodkind has written on this and demographers noticed that there were strong dragon year demographic spikes. That is, there were birth year effects in 76, 88, 8, 2000. This is true for all of the, Chinese, the overseas Chinese in Asia, Southeast Asia, including Taiwan and Hong Kong and the, the Chinese parts of Singapore, and as well as with some milder effects in Korea and Japan. Interestingly enough, there's no dragon effect year for China in 76, and only a very mild effect in 1988. But everyone has starts having very strong dragon year effects in 2000. We'll talk first about the other countries that show dragon year effects in 76 and 88, and we'll leave out China for the second paper I'm gonna discuss after this. So, it's, oh, by the way, if there's any small questions to clarify, you can interrupt if you would like, but I, I'll save the big questions for the end, okay? So that we can get the main idea. If you look at these areas that Goodkin studied based upon just little sources, look at this. What you see is 76 is a dragon year. Notice these three areas, Singapore, Taiwan, Peninsular Malaysia. Boop, boop, boop. Notice two things. This is a major demographic bump, you understand. It's rare for other things that you see, especially look at how steadily birth rates are collapsing. This is typical of all developing countries, developing countries in particular, here we have, you know, you basically, Malaysia, Taiwan, and Singapore are all developing very rapidly and all the birth rates are collapsing. But in the middle of a long period, notice from 60 to 74, 75, birth rates are falling almost every single year with one or two exceptions. There's a mild effect here for Malaysia. There's a mild, there's a bump here for Singapore. But for the most part, 
it's a steady downward trend. And then suddenly all three countries have these bumps upward, right? And then you get to 88 and you still have these same bumps upward. So this is a big effect. And this was noticeable. You have to understand the drag in your effects are not trivial. In fact, at first, the governments of these countries were very worried because think about what happens. That means there's crowding in schooling systems. Schooling systems are not set up to take a big increase in students for just one year. Um, of course, there's the question of whether there's pressure when these guys grow up and go, go into the job market. You know, are they hitting the job market at the same time? Plus things like even something as simple as the hospital births in the year in which you have a lot of babies, some of the most in-demand hospitals will become much more in demand or hospitals which normally have modest demand are suddenly full all the time. So in fact, this was serious enough that for example, Taiwan started writing to people and push, pushing articles that in, in 88 and 2000, before 88 and 2000, that this drag in your effect is not so great. And you're gonna, you know, you're gonna crowding, shouldn't have a drag in your baby. Don't do this, don't do this. But of course that didn't help. You still got this big bump in 88. Um, if we look at some of the interesting things, if we look at these areas, um, notice that initially the big bumps were here in these three areas. Hong Kong didn't show much of a bump at first. Uh, that is to say, it dropped. On the other hand, with, with Hong Kong, it was a rise in the sense that they were getting a birth rate drop of minus seven, and now they're getting a birth rate drop of minus 2%. But, that's, but the others are all seeing real positive effects of the dragon year. Uh, in contrast, you don't get anything in China. In fact, the dragon year is actually a huge negative effect in China, which another way of sort of saying, there's no correlation between the Jagger year effect in China. We'll discuss that later. So like I said, hold that off for now. If you look also at Singapore and Malaysia, the non-Chinese parts of Malaysia and Singapore, which are heavily Chinese in some areas and not others, are, are having negative growth. So you see in some ways, the non-Chinese parts are not responding as strongly as the Chinese parts of Singapore and Malaysia. All right. So. What happens? You, you have dragon crowding. And because of this, you have to start, people start asking the question, what are the effects of this, right? Now, since I wrote this paper many years ago, others have studied dragon crowding effects. For example, there's a recent paper that showed that in Singapore, there is an effect in terms of uh, jobs in Singapore. Um, there's also some effects in part of China that are negative. My guess is what's interesting is that it might depend on the area. So Singapore is a very small, relatively closed economy in the sense of jobs and so forth, the labor market. So it's quite likely that uh, you're going to observe the crowding more generally. But some people said there's no effect. For example, Wong and Yu, one of the earliest papers in this, found no income effect for dragon birds. But their data were taken from 1991 and 1995. Now, this is an example of something that where you have to pay attention. You, you might hear that the paper says there are no dragon year effects, but think of it. The dragon year is 1976, and they're looking at data 91 and 95. That means the oldest of these kids is 19. I don't think we would expect, and in fact, you know, and the, in the other case, it's an even earlier study. So for a group that's mostly teenagers, should we really expect to find big income, uh, income effects? I think not, since most people are getting their jobs around 2021. There's a big cohort that's going to college, and even the ones that don't go to college see the biggest income effects or in, in the later years. This is not going to tell you. In addition, their simple cross-section cross OLS, that is they simply run a comparison in a, in a cross-section ordinary least squares, that's not gonna be able to correct for age cohort birth effects and outcomes. That is to sort of say, maybe there's something special about certain years or areas that's related to just the general macro state of the economy that year. 
and not directly related to dragons. So you understand, this is not simply a matter of observing the dragons have, you know, the dragon year babies are doing well or not doing well. You have to correct for a large number of factors. So that's what we tried to do in this paper. The other thing we tried to do is look at Asians, Amer Asians in the US, both Asian immigrants to the US and Asian Americans in general. And that is very interesting because, of course, Asians are a very small minority of the United States, and Asian American immigrants are even smaller. Although they are concentrated in certain areas, usually on the two coasts near the, near the big cities, like San Francisco, New York, and Los Angeles. These are where you sort of see lots of Asians migrating there. But we can now compare, one of the things we can do is we can take into account not just how Asians doing, but we can compare Asian dragons to Asian American non-dragons to non-Asian dragons and to non-Asian Asian immigrants. So you see, we can have, you know, what's called some kind of multiple difference in difference framework. So we, moreover, we can correct for state fixed effects. So we can correct for which state they're born. We can correct for cohort fixed effects, et cetera. So we can really do a more careful comparison. That's really what it boils down to. Our paper is quite simple, but it requires some careful understanding of the data and working through it. And also trying to get a handle on what the different outcomes show. The other thing that's really interesting is of course, Asian Americans are already the most highly educated ethnic group in the United States. Furthermore, for this study, we're going to focus on Asian Americans who tend to believe in the dragon superstition. So we're talking Northeast Asians. We're excluding Filipinos, we're excluding Indians. So we're by Asian Americans now, we're not talking about all Asian Americans, but we're all talking about all Asian Americans who potentially care about the dragon year effects. And that group is among, is probably the highest educated large ethnic group of immigrants to the United States, right? And so that makes it interesting. For Notice that once you already have a high level of something, to get any sort of significant effect is much more difficult, right? So that the typical Asian American immigrant gets something like 14 years of education on average. That means on average, the average Asian American gets a few years of college. That's another way of sort of saying a very large fraction of Asian Americans goes to college, right? And then a smaller number go to college and don't finish. And then a very small number just go to high school. So this is a very interesting background. So what do we look at this? Well, it turns out Dragons do do better. Not only do Asian American dragons have more education than the average American, but they have more than half a year, they have half a year more education than non-dragon Asians. If we look only at immigrants, this actually in some, in some parts, depending on what some corrections, this increases to almost a full year of education. What does this mean in reality? It means that a much larger fraction of Asian American immigrants who are dragons do better than other Asian American immigrants. So this is not about Asians having high rates of education. This is about Asian dragons having even higher rates of education than non-dragons. This is what a big effect is. What does this mean in reality? Having a year or anything from four months to a year more college, basically the extra months we're picking up are picking up the fact a much larger fraction of Asian Americans who are dragons are finishing college or some are trying college who never even tried at all. And that's, that's, that's really quite big. If you look at an example of some, if you just mean numbers, look at this. If you just look at um, Dragon Year and non-Asian, there's over a year difference. This is just overall. If we look at Dragon Year Asians with non-Asian Dragon Years, so we're comparing to all non-Asians who are born in the Dragon Year. So this is not about 
the dragon year being very good for education in general. One way you can look at it is if you look at non-Asians here in the dragon year versus the non-dragon year, they have virtually the same levels of education, average education, right? Both are about 13.3. However, if you look at Asians only, they have in the dragon year versus the non-dragon year, there's over a third difference of a year. But comparing Asians to non-Asians in the dragon year, you get 1.3 years. And non-dragon year Asians have about 0.9 years more education than non-Asians from non-dragon years. So as you can see, this difference is substantial. If you also look at in the graph, if we look at Asians versus non-Asians, this is the average of educational attainment of all Americans who are non-Asian. This is averages all of them, and you get these different. So you get a difference of about a year, right? But notice in the dragon year that spikes. If we look at just immigrants, the gap is even bigger because non-Asian American immigrants tend to have much lower levels of education. On average, the average non-Asian immigrant to the United States barely finishes high school. So the, the average Asian American immigrant has not finished high school. It's less than 12 years of schooling. In contrast, the average Asian American immigrant has definitely finished high school and has some years of college. Okay, so you see these very big differences. Formally, what we do is run uh, a regression like this. We're basically we're running a, a simple regression, but we're now controlling for gender, income, state fixed effects, age fixed effects, year of birth effects. So we're doing the comparisons that the earlier work had not done. And when we look at that, we get notes of the following. This is, we're just picking up that Asian versus non-dragon education, there's this extra uh, four, tenths, uh, four tenths of a year of education compared to other Asian differences and Asian versus non-immigrant immigration, there's, there's two thirds of a year difference, all right? When we look at these things, we're, we're still looking at a pooled cross-section. We're looking at a whole bunch of groups. We're still comparing a number of different countries. So we might have to worry about country effects and things of that sort. Unfortunately, we couldn't get very detailed data at the national level for all the different countries and all the different births. They're often crowded together into the Asian category. But we can get the following. We can look, we have a subset of people, mostly from California and the West Coast, that we know are Taiwanese. So not just Asians in general, these are actually Taiwanese and we have information about other Taiwanese. What do we find? We show that those born in the are more and Taiwanese are much higher are higher educated on the average even than the average Asian immigrant. And what do we find? Taiwanese immigrants are on average six percent more likely to hold a bachelor's degree than non-Taiwanese immigrants born in the same year. So another way to put it, Taiwanese immigrants tend to their children tend to get more education. Most of them go to college. And even with a group where most are going to college, the dragon year kids are 6% more likely to go to college. You understand that this is an amazing, amazing result. For you to appreciate how big a result this is, realize that in lots of studies, the mother having a lot of education only adds often like a month or two extra schooling on average to many families. Very often the difference between mothers who have say, you know, a full college degree versus those who have only 13 or 14 years of college, uh, of schooling, including only a couple of years of college, those effects on the child's education are not very big on average. If you look even at things like income, they're smaller than you realize per standard deviation. This is a group that's near the top already and has a ginormous one third to one half to two thirds year education effect on these families. So that is a truly, truly amazing difference. So I want you to understand, it may not sound like much to hear 
you know, four months or six months or seven months. But when you're looking at a large cohort of students, that's a very big effect. And if we look at this is just the technical cross table of what we're doing with the Taiwanese, and this is the probability of finishing college. And we have some summary statistics. So if you look in general, this is we're just repeating the average statistics of Asian versus non-Asian immigration, right? That's what you're really getting from these numbers. Uh, I've already showed you other data that get you to this. And notice that we have a general pool of over 70,000 people and the, the Asians only constitute 2,500 out of the pool of around 73,000 people that we studied, that we got the data from. Okay, so this is a fairly large sample, but the Asians are a much smaller group. So here's the question, why do Asian babies get more education? Is the dragon year really lucky? Well, there are in economics two major reasons why this might occur, having nothing to do with the dragon year per se. One might be selection effects. That is to sort of say the people born in the year of the dragon come from families that are themselves more educated or themselves more richer. The other alternative is that dragon babies are treated differently. We couldn't look at that treatment effect, but there is a paper that's already published about the Vietnam families that follow the dragon year. And what do they find in Vietnam? When you have two siblings and one is born in the dragon year, the one born in the dragon year is likely to do better, especially in education. So there is a potential treatment effect in that sense. Our paper doesn't seem to show that, but we can't test that. So of course, we don't know whether there's a treatment effect or not. But what we do know is dragon babies have good mothers. Now, what does that mean? The dragon baby picks its mother? No, it means that the data showed that if we look at 88 and 2000, where we have good data, we don't have it for 76, but Asian mothers who have dragon babies are more educated, richer and older than non-Asian mothers of babies in the same year. That is $5,000 richer, more likely to finish college and about two and a half years older. Another way of putting this is the people likely or a big fraction, not all, but a big fraction of those likely to care and have babies in a dragon year are likely to be older, richer, more educated moms or more educated families. So another way of putting it, dragon babies are doing well because the comparison group, that is to say all, all other dragon children, the all other dragon families are on average richer and more educated and more likely to finish college. Now it's obviously not the dragon year causing the moms to be more educated. It's obviously not the dragon year causing the parents to be richer. It's the other way around. This suggests that the people choosing to have babies, why is this the case? Well, good mothers can time births better. If you think about it this way, richer families have more, in some sense, what this is telling us is having ba a dragon baby is a luxury good. Think about it another way. On average, mothers have something like two babies per family in Asia, or less in some cases, like Japan, which is shrinking. So you're talking about a world in which lots of families have only one kid or two kids. If you have only one or two kids and the dragon year comes around once every 13 years, think about the planning necessary. Imagine that you get married and the dragon year is not coming for six years. Are many families going to, even if you think the dragon superstition is good, are you going to wait six years to try to have that child? And what happens if you don't get the child that year at all? Is it worth the risk of delaying so long? Especially remember, these are older mothers sometimes. Plus, if you look at the Chinese results in 76, in fact, if you look at all the Asian countries, there's no dragon year effect at all before 1976. So even though the dragon year superstition has been true 
all of the 20th century. As far as we can tell, there are no special dragon year effects before 76. So this is interesting, right? There's debates about the modernist, modernization hypothesis, which says that as people get richer, more urbanized, they become more lay, that is they, they less likely to have traditional superstitious or religious beliefs. Now, there's been a lot of work showing that's not always true. And this also contributes to that literature. In fact, it could be the other way around. It's quite possible that dragon year families that are choosing to have dragon, as opposed to those who just have it randomly, they're not preparing, but the ones who choose to have babies in the dragon year are wealthy enough that they're making a choice to have a dragon year baby. Why would they do that? Well, possibly they believe the superstition, but maybe it's also just a kind of identity marker. As you're getting richer and otherwise everything, many old traditions are dying, you also have a chance to focus on some traditions which help you stand out or which for you become symbolic of your, or your ethnic identity. We're just guessing on this. We don't have any deep sociological information in this. All we know is that the dragon baby phenomenon is not a family so much of a traditional family. It's not a typical of traditional families. It's typical of ethnic East Asian families who tend to be more middle class. And that this shows up only later. So interesting enough, for example, if you look at these things, the last 2000 and 2012 had fairly big effects. What does this all suggest us? We can conclude that in this case, the dragon superstition is self-fulfilling. Why is it self-fulfilling? Well, in the other studies, it's not. But in the Asian American case, it might be self-fulfilling. Why? Because if you look at other Asian dragon babies, you go, hey, he's a dragon. And notice how many smart dragon kids there are. Smart, i.e. they do well in school or they finish more years of school. If you look around in the United States among Asian American families, the dragon year kid is on average likely to have higher education. Now you might interpret that superstitiously as that's because he's a dragon. The more accurate interpretation as we're seeing from my data are that parents who are richer and more educated are much more likely to have dragon year babies. By the way, this also shows up in the fact that there's a larger fraction of dragon year babies who are only children. So that tells you a lot that the family only has one child and yet they work hard to time the child for the dragon year. Think about it another way. If the parent is very poor and they're scrabbling just to survive, they're not gonna work really hard. They won't really have a lot of time to focus on timing their one baby for the dragon year or even one of their two babies for the dragon year. That's a lot of effort for someone who's actually has more important problems to worry about. Like, can they get enough food to eat and where can they live? What are the possible extensions of this if one wanted to continue work? And we've been focusing on some of the ideas, these ideas in some other work. Do later generations continue to have preferences for dragons? For example, do dragon babies want that more dragons? Do, do immigrants who are third generation in America care about the dragon superstition? Or is it only for first and second generation immigrants? Are there marriage effects? What we don't know is what happens to boys and girls? Are, are dragons more likely to get married? Is this effect different for boys or for girls? This is relevant too, because there are some superstitions that are not strongly shared by many countries. But for example, Japan has a tiger superstition that says girls born in the year of the tiger are fierce so that they actually make bad wives. And so there's a story in Japan, I haven't tested this, but when I was in Japan, I was told by lots of people, including women who said they were, they were unmarried and born in the tiger year who said that yes, in Japan takes seriously the idea that tiger years are, are bad for women who are trying to get married. The other thing that happens is that the final interesting question, and this would take much longer, is that once everybody starts getting richer and everybody can afford to have dragon babies, so that the average parent of a dragon baby is maybe 
not so rich anymore. That is more like an ordinary parent. Does the dragon superstition or the desire go get weaker? Does, does the effect of having dragons have a harder time getting into a good college because they're crowding like they might be in Taiwan or Singapore or because they're having a hard time getting a good job? Does that offset the psychological benefits of getting a dragon baby? Or is it one of the prices they're willing to pay for having a child who is um, lucky? Follow-up research. Now I'm gonna just mention quickly some material from a research paper we've been doing on China. We've been using, looking at Chinese there from 2000 and 2012, and we're actually waiting ideally for, I think the 2012 data just came in. We were only looking at 2000 data. So we're gonna use the 2012 data. And if we are willing to wait, I think we can finish with 2000 and 2012. We just got the 2012 data a couple of years ago, but Ideally, actually, we'd even wait further so we have 2024 data for China. But we want to look at the special case of the People's Republic of China. As I told you, China doesn't show any dragon year birth effects till 88, and only in small parts of China. The first really big search occur, surge occurs in 2000 and reappears in 2012. In 2012, you could find lots of stories on dragon babies in China, both in the Western press and in the Chinese press, right? These are like some of the pictures you see, dragging your mother up here. And this is a problem. There were many pictures like this in Chinese hospitals where there were so many babies born, they often had to keep the carts with the babies in the, in the, you know, in the halls for a while as the rooms were getting too crowded to hold all the babies being born in that year in some hospitals. Right, so you see these stark big effects in China. So with China, we looked at something different. With China, we tried to understand what explains which areas had dragon babies first. What are the factors? And that's what we looked at in detail. We were looking at city level and regional level to, to sort of figure out where these effects are having. And I'm not gonna go through the paper because it's not really finished, uh, we have an early draft, but we want to do more with it. But I'll summarize the main results. One, dragons were strongest in coastal, that is near the East Coast, or high economic growth areas, areas with rapidly growing labor markets. What does that suggest? It suggests that rapid economic development and possibly access to media from Taiwan and Hong Kong in the 1990s were most effective. Remember in the 90s, cable wasn't that strong yet and you didn't have the modern internet. So very often the way you got media was to be able to receive radio and also to receive television. Well, people on the coastal parts of China could receive signals, especially if they had a satellite from media in Hong Kong and Taiwan. The closer you are to Hong Kong and Taiwan, the easier it was to get radio and even television from Hong Kong and Taiwan. And one story might be, the, 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 therefore, the cultural influence of Taiwan and Hong Kong are much richer in these eastern areas. There's also more travel. So, for example, people in Fujian province, unlike the rest of China, are given special visas, which make it easier for them to travel between China and Taiwan than the rest of uh, China. So all these aspects are going to be things that would argue that areas which are growing, again, notice it's not traditional areas. It's not the rural areas where you might think traditional Chinese beliefs are going to be stronger. It's actually newer areas. It's areas with growing populations. It's areas with a big influx of new workers. And it's areas that are on average a bit richer. They're either richer and they're more culturally modern in the sense that they're more tied to what's happening to Hong Kong and Taiwan, which were substantially richer than China in those times. Finally, we can see in both our general study and the specific China one, that it's again, this factor that the dragon belief is, it may not be stronger the belief, but its expression, that is to say its consequences in terms of actual birth 
are stronger in the areas that are richer, more middle class, more urban, and in some sense, more developing, which is both interesting of itself. It may be relevant for other superstitions. I wonder, for example, to what extent European immigrants to the United States start caring about markers of their home country more in the United States than they did when they were in their home country. I don't know about this, but this is an interesting question to ask. Do Eastern European, do Western European, do Russian immigrants try to look for Russian things to hold on to? So anecdotally, I've spent a lot of time lecturing in Russia since I was an economic, international economic advisor to the higher school of economics in Moscow. And I remember talking to some immigrants in the United States who sort of say, and there are like little Russian, small Russian shops in America that sell Russian foods and other goods. And they said, it's funny, when I was in Russia, I didn't even want to buy some of these things. But now that in America, I miss these things at home. So I'll buy more of certain types of foods and, and products that I never bought when I was in Russia, but I'll buy now that in the States because I want them for me and I want them for my family. And so the interesting question is, what about Russian beliefs? Are Russian beliefs even more important if you live abroad than when you are in Russia? Is Novi Good, God, is New Year celebration stronger or weaker when you're outside or when you're inside your home country? Anyway, I'm early and that will give us more time for questions. I'm actually done. I plan for a maximum of one hour. I, my, my procedure is never to go beyond the time limit. I, I prefer questions very much to just hearing myself talk, which is kind of boring. But uh, I look forward to hearing any questions you have. And thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you a lot, John. You, you've raised a lot of interesting questions, actually. And uh, if I may, I would uh, say something I've heard about uh, those effects of uh, New Year, uh, holidays, and etc. Uh, while being not in Russia, from Russians, but being not in Russia. And uh -huh. it's like a kind of bonding procedure, bonding. Uh, yes. Yeah, so it it, 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 it it somehow helps those people to to feel uh, that they are Russian from from Russia mm -hmm. and uh, to, to, to bring some some part of, of, of our culture of our uh, country to, to where they are. Well, actually, I heard this from those who are in, in America, in, in the US. Yeah. So how do you want to handle questions? Will you just pick them? Uh, I have a uh, couple of questions from different places and okay. one uh, in, in here in chat. Um, I, I can read uh, the f first the, the one that is here. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of dragons, are the only imaginary uh, are, are they only imaginary animals of the hor horoscope in fact in fact chimera meanwhile it's a symbol of celebration in all Asian countries. Uh, do you believe that they uh, we? Have really existed and what for? What? Uh, I think it's the question about uh, have have the dragons actually been uh, the animals? And uh, I think yes. Uh, well, I mean uh, that's a different story, right? I mean that's just the you know the idea of the dragon belief. It's interesting that both Western and Eastern cultures have some notion to the dragon, Wh where it comes from and whatnot. That I have no idea. But you know, some people suggest maybe the idea of dragons comes from seeing bones of dinosaurs or things like that. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, but no, I, I, I can't speak anything about the actual superstition itself. I'm just talking about the fact that there's this long existing tradition of the dragons. You can read up about it if you'd like, and there are a lot of stories they tell about this, and uh, some of them, uh, you know, I think of why there's no year of the cat and the cat got left behind in the race for all the animals and that kind of thing. So it's up to you. Also, there is a question uh, uh, about how did it happen that so uh, serious uh, scientists uh, like you and uh, others would just think about uh, starting such such a research about, about on this theme? How, how ah, that's a very good question. Well, Clearly, we did it because we were intrigued by the demographics paper you've written. Demographers study population effects. And it's clear that for demographers, 
Um, one, we live in unprecedented times, right? Um, for example, never in any of era of human history before the 20th century did the wealthiest groups, both within countries and across countries, have the fewest kids. You understand, well until the middle of the 19th century, in England, for example, richer families had more surviving children. That in general, wealth was essential to survival, and so you had more kids that survived to adulthood if you were richer. Today is in some sense by his human historic standards, nearly unprecedented. The fact that a huge fraction of the world and the fraction of the world that is wealthiest and most educated, those people and those families are having the fewest kids. Whereas the largest number of kids that are surviving are from poorer families or poorer countries, where poorer countries are on average likely to have higher birth rates than rich countries. This has never happened in the history of the universe, right? In, in like 2 million years of human beings, being wealthy was, was one of the ways in which you help your children survive. What this effect has on tradition or effect, we don't know, but this is certainly, um, a very, very interesting uh, effect. Now, as an economist, I look at this and I start thinking just more direct things. Are, are people having dragon children getting purely psychic benefits? Or does it help them in the labor market? Do employers see they're a dragon and think they're better? Do other, do other Asians want to marry them, right? Do the parents treat their kids better and therefore they, they, um, they, they encourage them to learn more, they give them more positive feedback? So th these touch on a lot of issues that economists care about. They care about how treatment, for example, there's a lot of questions about how, with how much does education matter? How much does parental involvement matter? For example, there's a lot of evidence that lots of parental involvement doesn't make a very big difference in a child's life, contrary to what you will read. Doesn't mean that parents can't matter, but once you have basic levels of education, um, inherent characteristics of a child, like the child's underlying personality and the child's underlying health, height, uh, in intelligence, these matter more very often than what parents do. You can read studies about how separated twins often have many similar outcomes in life, even if they're living with different families. Conversely, brothers and sisters who are living together, who are biologically re related, but not twins, who are very different, even though they live in the same environment, often respond to the same environment quite differently. There's a lot of data showing that often peer effects the other kids in the environment that the children live in matter more to their behavior than in some sense what the parents teach them. So it's very interesting. I mean, there's a lot of issues like this. And so that any policy issues we would have, it would not be about dragon years. We don't really care so much about the dragon years, although um, it's already being discussed. For example, Taiwan seems to have flipped from trying to discourage people from having babies in dragon years to encouraging it because they're worried that depopulation is occurring. They're already worried that the, the population rate is falling too fast. So they feel that anything that raises the population, even if it's harmful in the short run, in the sense that there's some crowding, is, is better than continuing this trend of depopulation. My guess is China is going to worry about this. After a long period of one child policy, they've been relaxing the one child policy. And one of the things they're finding is that in particular urban women, women again in these areas likely to have dragons, still don't seem to want to have more babies. Even when they've made it easier to have more than one child now, lots and lots of families still prefer to have one, ch one child. They don't want more children. So it's interesting that after half a century of limiting families number of children. Now they reverse their policy, but it's not reversing so much. But also it's the same families who are more likely to have dragon children. So that, you know, again, 
there's this issue. If you look at lots of, especially Asian countries, all the rich Asian countries and areas like Singapore have very low birth rates. And so it's an interesting question about you know, the French have worried for a long time about low birth rates. And now most of Europe and America is going to worry about low birth rates. And so there's an interesting question. How do you encourage it? What should be done? What can be done? What matters? The evidence that you can encourage high birth rates is not very good. Many of the countries in Europe have generous health care, generous leaves, many of these things, but the net effects on fertility aren't very big. So what's interesting is this superstition, which seems very minor, has this gigantic effect, at least in the short run, on birds in one special year. Other questions? There, are, there is a following question. Yes. Um, is there a correlation between the stages of development of China uh, and uh, this uh, dragon year um, educational uh, change? Well, we already seen that. I mean, we already see that. Obviously, all, all countries went to a stage where they were poor and under the undeveloped, and they, there was no dragon effect. And then as they became middle class, which is Malaysia, Singapore, Taiwan were getting richer and more successful in the 70s, and the Chinese populations in those areas had the dragon bump. So Malaysia is interesting, right? So roughly I think 30% of Malaysia is Chinese, and the other 70% is other mostly Malay ethnicity. And the Malay ethnicities don't believe in the dragon superstition. The Chinese part does. And it's the Chinese part that sees the bump in Malaysia. So they're a minority in Malaysia, but they're a large minority. And that's where you got the birth bump. OK. Well, uh, there has been a question here in chat about the policymakers suggestion for policymakers. Well, I think you have. I've, I think I've covered that. I think the real issue you want to think about this for policymakers is also um, what role fertility plays, what role treatment plays. Another interesting thing, too, is that can the government really do much to encourage people to study more? There's a big concern about uh, the large number of people who don't finish high school and don't go to college. How do we encourage groups that don't go to college to go to college? And that's very, very difficult. There's been a lot of attempts. There's all sorts of scholarships. There's incentives. Many private universities give free tuition. Many of the very elite schools just automatically give um, full tuition. Like many of the Ivy League, I think, just give free full tuition to the students they accept whose income is below a certain level. And, and yet, you know, there, we're finding out that except for a very few take up, in the effect of all these in, in, interventions, and uh, innovations and encouragements doesn't seem to have a very big effect on people going to school. Uh, and yet somehow this treatment, that is this one thing about parents caring very much about their kids, you know, one story is that wanted babies do better. One way to think, if the parent is planning to have you, then you are not a random accidental kid. Oh, yeah. And another story is that the ones we know are wanted, and dragon babies are wanted for sure, are likely to do better in life. There is another question. I, I don't know if we, if we should ans ans answer this uh, really, but what is the underperforming group? You, you have <laughs> talked more. <laughs> Well, I mean, like I said, the underperforming group is other Asians, but they're not underperforming by a lot. It's a mild effect. Oh, you mean the big underperforming groups? Well, there are a lot of the ethnicities who have tend to have lower education, right? So the bulk of the U.S. immigrants are Hispanic, and they're because they come from the poor, poor Latin countries, and also they're sometimes even. Um, they're below when they arrive. They're below average American education and income. And um, one thing that happens is even second, third generation Hispanic immigrants do not converge to the American average. So European and Asians converge. In fact, Asians within one generation, even those from lower incomes, tend to hit the American average or higher. So if you look, if you compare groups, for example, um, 
East Asian Americans tend to have much higher education. Some other groups, for example, Filipinos have more of a mix and have a lot of lower income, uh, a lot of lower education people arriving. But Filipinos as a group tend to do at least as well, if not better than the American average. In contrast, many Latin American groups, actually in some ways, the first generation, the immigrant who comes or even the illegal immigrant who becomes legal, tends to develop better education and income over time. With the immigrants, with their children though, it doesn't always work out that way. Or they do a bit better, but they never get up to the American average. That is again, we're talking about the, the average family. Of course, the huge exceptions. Even the whole term Hispanic immigration is ridiculous because there are areas that Hispanic immigrants are mostly well-educated, mostly upper income. And there are large areas where the Hispanic immigrants coming there are mostly poor and poorly educated. So that's gonna have very different effects. But looking as a whole, you see much lower average education. So again, part of this is because you're mixing up different groups. But there's still the interesting question is, how do you motivate children to go to school? And why do some parents know this? There are a lot of parents who struggle with getting their kids to do their homework, let alone think about a less educated family trying to convince their children to get more education than their parents did. If neither parent is college educated, can you create, even if you're middle class and, college edu and not college educated, but you have the money, can you convince your kid to work hard enough to go to college? That's an interesting question a lot of people ask. Yeah, there's no easy answer for that. Also, uh, there is a question about, have uh, you had any uh, mainland China response to your academic? Not exactly. What I've seen is like the papers looking at the treatment effect, looking within Chinese families, and they see this education, and they also sort of, basically, I think a recent paper showed what we said in this paper, and they showed it with more data that the selection effects are driving it. It's like the families that are having dragon children are more likely to be ones who are more prosperous. So basically, they're, conf they're confirming that within China, this effect we're observing in Asian American immigrants is true, which is selection. It's not that they're magically better. It's that the families that are having dragon babies are tend to be better off socioeconomically. So they do get more luck by believing in uh, and investing in their child's. Well, they, they may not even get more luck, right? We don't know if they invest that much in the child, but they don't, exactly. If, they were, if they're born in a different year, it's not luck they're getting, they're getting nicer treatment. They care about their children, they're investing in their children, and the children are encouraged to believe that they're good. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Exactly. Well, we're just right in time. Yeah, yeah. I, I see no more questions. If you there nobody, no, really, I'm here for another 10 minutes if you want to, or something, otherwise we'll end. But ask me any questions if you have any, or even about this topic or anything else you want that's related to economics of demography or population. If there's nothing, I'm, that's fine with me too. But let me know if you have any other questions. Well, I, I, I see one more question from Olga here in chat but i can't understand the meaning maybe it's, what's the question um moscow coat of arms depicts saint george the victorious killing a dragon with a spear uh, and why in europe unlike asia have dragons always perceived hosts hostily ah, i understand i understand this is i think just simply goes back to the different the different traditions right um, the Westerners tend to see dragons as um, as these actual creatures who menaced people, whereas the Chinese developed a mythology around them that saw them as harbingers of good fortune. Why that's the case, I don't know. It's quite possible even that what Chinese think as dragons are not the same thing as Westerners think of dragons. Oh, that's for sure. That's right? for sure so, because, yeah, that's... Uh, Chinese are like uh, they have been uh, sailing a lot and uh, fishing right. a lot. And, uh, exactly. 
dragons goes from the fishing it's it's a, it's an actual animal from the from the sea well, and i think what that what that may mean is that i think all that happens when westerners got to china and contacted them they had these traditions and the way to explain these traditions to each other was right. to call what the chinese call dragons the same things as what the westerners call dragons but actually there may be even different totally different creatures but today we just treat them as if they're the same thing one new message, what do we say? Yeah, is it possible the dragon kids luck hits a plateau in the following years? Well, yes, that's the, it could be, actually be worse. As I said, there's some evidence from Singapore that they have a harder time getting a job because if everybody graduates in the same year, they're all looking for the same good jobs. But the jobs don't that haven't necessarily increased, but the number of people looking for them have got up. But the, there's a longer term question, which is imagine that China gets richer. And so say not all, but most Chinese families, let's say even if even forget about the rest of the rural China, let's say all of urban China starts having dragon babies. And it doesn't really matter because most parents are middle class. Then what will you'll see is that the average dragon will not be more educated. Or we'll, not be. We'll, we'll stay the average. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The average becomes the average. Yeah. That's the point. They're not lucky because of the year they're born. They're lucky because of what their parents did to, you know. We, we have a, a birth age uh, cross effect, as they, as they call it in Russia. Um, and in 88, 1988, we had a peak of, of, of birth. Uh, rate and uh, it happens that the system didn't uh, cope with all those new children and the same way it happened in 2000s so it 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 correlates with what you say about the uh, those countries that you sh you have shown and maybe uh, it actually has some effect too on on those uh, dragons so yeah, we, we are dragons. <laughs> Maybe we, we, we are just many. You know? <laughs> yeah. As I have seen in this chat, the, there are many dragons here now listening. <laughs> yeah. That's why they care. Uh, I, I see a question. Why did COVID not result in a higher number of births? Well, I'm sure a lot of people will be studying this question because is it true that there were no higher births anywhere? I'm not sure. But if it's possible that you know, maybe nobody wants to have babies when it's a time of, uh, you know, of, of illness or potential pandemic. I don't know. And I, I can believe that in some areas, uh, births might actually go up. So I think it will take a while before there's enough data for people to look at this. But I'm sure this is an issue that demographers, the specialists and people who collect this data and study it, will try to understand it. And then this Eleni Kisiri says, are there any steps to prevent that? To prevent what, Eleni? I'm not sure. Can you tell me? Uh, what are, what? Plateau of the following years. So that's- uh, Oh, you mean the plateau? Yeah. But that's not, why, why do you want to prevent? There's nothing to prevent it. You understand? It's like, it doesn't mean the dragon babies are going to do worse. It means that, look, if you're from a rich family with an educated mother, you're likely to do better. It's very simple. If you're from a poor family with a with less educated poor family, the average chance is you have less chance to do well. That's not going to change regardless of what year you're born. You understand? The luck doesn't come from the year. It comes from your parents and how they treat you. If your parents are educated, or even if they're not, if they love you, they care for you, they encourage you to be educated, you have more chances to do better. It's that simple. But I also thought that if somebody people asking, like I said, I hope I've answered the question of why this is related to economics. Because in general, there's a lot of things we study, like treatments. Uh, we think about things that boost, you know, there have been lots of studies about people who are boosted education, does one an extra year of education help? Does it matter if you go to school late or early, right? There are all these kinds of questions that are very important and have economic relevance. Similarly, I'm sure there are studies gonna be happen. Do people, were people who are born in COVID years or were people who finished high school in COVID years or were people who finished college in COVID years? What happens to them in the job market? Do they better or worse? 
So I'm sure there are things like this that are very important. It's just part of the issue is whenever there's some shock to a population, there are social, cultural, demographic, and economic effects. And we want to understand those. There is one more interesting question. How do you okay. think, is there any incentive to create some kind of such myth or belief like dragons do better, or dragons year gets uh, no, no higher luck? Of something. But when I was being interviewed by Freakonomics Radio, um, that's one of the questions that came up. They said, can't we just make uh, a, a lucky year for every year so everybody feels better? Well, one is that it's really hard to create superstitions that stick. That's why artificial ones usually don't work very well. Sometimes you can make up something new and it works. You know, so, you know, companies try to make, th think about even holidays. Lots of companies or have encouraged the government to make, you know, something like uh, something like Mother's Day, but it's something else, right? This National Reading Day or things like that, but they don't matter so much. Why is it that things like Mother's Day and Valentine's Day matter so much? Or just think of another one, International Women's Day. 3-8 is not a big deal in America. It is a very big deal in large parts of the world. How do you leave that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that, I mean, whereas Valentine's Day is super important all around the world. Conversely, look at Halloween. Halloween and its celebration is a typically American tradition. But now more and more countries in around the world have Halloween parties, even though more, you don't have the opportunity in many cities that were just big apartment buildings to walk around the neighborhood and beg for candy from all your neighbors. You can't do this, but, you know, I see that I mean, I couldn't believe it when I saw that Russian families were celebrating Halloween. I said, this is so unusual to me. And so, so it seems that choosing which fashions or superstitions will become popular or take Japan. They don't, they're mostly not Christians so they don't celebrate Christmas, but now they do, but it's like a kind of party to them. And people often go to clubs or ask people out on dates. It becomes a kind of Halloween for them. Christmas Day, whereas in America, it's much more of a family day. So it's a, it's a totally different feeling. And yet, it's very hard to create artificial superstitions or artificial yeah. traditions. If, if I may, I have one of my questions. Um, there is a book, Outliers, by Malcolm Gladwell. And he writes about some effects on the date of birth uh, in, uh, in the sports. Um, because created because of um, the, um, the schooling system. Yeah, yeah. The, how, how the system works mm -hmm. and that it mm -hmm. takes uh, children from the special days. Yeah, and, and right. this, so, etc. Maybe there is some kind of such um, a cycle, cyclical, uh, economical effects that. No, but those are just simply the luck of like. It, it's exactly like the studies of. Uh, when they're going to school a year late or a year early helps. So they've looked at, for example, in America, many school districts have strict cutoffs. You have to be born with a certain date or a certain date to, to, to go to the school. Well, you can look in some sense, the kids who are born both before and after a cutoff date are going to be virtually the same age, right? The difference will be a couple of days, but they will go to school in different years. Some, the ones who are born in one side will go to school early compared to the average student. And the other born in the other side will go to school late compared to the average children. And so people can study what are the effects of late schooling or, or maybe, early schooling. So maybe. the effect is not the date. The date is not what's doing it. The, the, the effect is the cutoff of when someone participates in something. Yeah, maybe, maybe there are some cutoffs of- Oh yeah, there are lots of different things. For example, I believe that there are more births on January 1st in America compared to December 31. Can you guess why? I don't know. Because of the taxation. If you're born in the previous year, you can be counted. Every child, you get a tax deduction. Oh my God. But if you're born in January, I'm oh, sorry, if you're born on December 31st, not January 1st, or other way around, yeah. there are more births on the 31st. So if you're born in the older year, you can claim a deduction earlier, but you can't claim a deduction January 1st. Oh so, I, so, the, so people have incentive to push the birth back from January 1 to December 31. 
So, I mean, as you would expect, there are many things like that. And other ways is that you also have births because since June is a popular month for weddings, then you can expect that nine months later will be a popular time to have babies, etc. Well, thank you a lot, John. It has been a very nice lecture, very interesting. And uh, I have a lot of uh, thanks in chats all around. Uh, so thank you for coming. Thank and you to everybody. And yeah. for those, and I hope uh, both, and thank you to everyone who's watching me now and everyone who will watch the broadcast of this later for those who couldn't make it to this strange time period. Thank yeah, you very I think much. a lot of Chinese and Asian people are sleeping now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we have a lot of them here. So yeah, I I, I wish you join uh, this lecture tomorrow when when you will watch the recording. Thank yeah. you. Thank you all. Bye bye.